Sorry, I just have to move the stool. <laughs> Oops. Okay. Um, hey everyone, good morning. My name's Roshni and I'm from Singapore. And today I represent Southeast Asia. So I'm wearing batik today, which is the national costume pretty much of Southeast Asia. So I'm going to share with you all some of my key lessons that I've learned by running a company in Southeast Asia over the last few years. But I'm also going to talk a little bit about the Southeast Asian ecosystem, which I'm sure everyone here is quite familiar with. <laughs> um, okay, as a show of hands, can I just uh, see how many people have businesses in Southeast Asia? Okay, pretty good. More than half the crowd. <laughs> and what about uh, for those, have, have the rest of you all worked in Southeast Asia? Yeah? Okay. Awesome. So, um, I think everyone here is quite familiar with Southeast Asia, but I hope that you'll still learn a couple of things, uh, new things. Uh, and these are generally through my experiences, as well as what's happened in the ecosystem in the last 24 months. So, a little bit about myself. Um, so, I run Southeast Asia's largest reproductive technology company, and I focus on getting women pregnant, as well as having healthy pregnancies and raising healthy families. So, we're about 30 million moms who use us on a monthly basis, either to conceive or to help raise their child. And we're available in 12 countries across Asia, most of the um, main markets in Southeast Asia, and where as a group we have about 250 people, most of them engineers working on how to help women get pregnant as well as have healthy pregnancies. <clears throat> We're backed by some of Asia's largest conglomerates as well as venture capital companies uh, who are really focused on the reproductive health technology or consumer internet space. So a little bit about the market that I'm in. If you see, Southeast Asia is about half the size of China. But when it comes to the number of babies born, Southeast Asia is going to overtake China in the next three years. So that's a very important demographic because as the, the most important number here to look at is total fertility rate. In order for a population to replace itself, you need a total fertility rate of 2.1. Most countries are not producing enough babies to replace themselves. In order, um, so if you look at Europe itself, in the EU, the total fertility rate is 1.6. I think Germany is about 1.5. So it's not replacing its own population. The same thing is happening in China. Every year, population has been decreasing, even though China has opened up its one-child policy. Whereas in Southeast Asia, we're producing 2.3 babies per woman. So we're increasing as a population. The same thing happens, so there are only four regions in the world where we're replacing ourselves. The first one, of course, is the African nations, and then it's Middle East, South Asia, which is India, Nepal, Bangladesh, as well as Southeast Asia. Now, a little bit about the tech ecosystem in Southeast Asia. In the last four years, $37 billion has been invested into tech companies in Southeast Asia. $24 billion has been invested into the 12 unicorns of Southeast Asia, and about $7 billion into 3,000 other internet economy startups like my company, Akasam, Zilingo, and everyone else uh, in the audience here today. <clears throat> One of the things about Southeast Asia, like a lot of other markets, is that it's dominated by male founders, uh, usually ethnically uh, Chinese male, Chinese or Indian male founders. Um, but that's starting to change, and I'm really, really happy and excited that here in DLD, the first half of the morning and, you know, all the Southeast Asian panels are all dominated by women. So good job there. <laughs> um, so I, I liken growing a company to having a sturdy stool. We're not trying to build a unicorn here, right? That's a mythical thing. We don't know if it exists or not. But we want to create something that's sturdy, that can be created into a beautiful table or could be created into a beautiful chair, something that could become very comfortable, but ultimately, it needs to be sturdy. And one of the things about a stool is it's three legs. And the most important leg is the market. The market is the most important thing because you can't change how a population is. You can't change the demographics of a population. You can't change whether there's going to be a market or an audience for what you're trying to offer. So let's look at the market first. Now, Southeast Asia has a lot of words that you can use to describe it. It's big, it's diverse, it's, it's colorful. Um, and if you look at it, it ranges from population size in Singapore, really small, 6 million people, all the way to Indonesia, nearly 270 million people. You look at the currency of Southeast Asia, it's not like the EU where you have the euro. 
We have different currencies. We have different inflation rates. We have different government policies. We also have different corporate tax rates. So it ranges from 17% in Singapore. So if you want to set up a HQ, do it in Singapore. You're going to pay less taxes. And it goes up all the way to 30, uh, 39%. Um, if we look at the ease of business index, it's number two in Singapore. So that means you go into a bank and you can set up your bank account, your business bank account in under 24 hours. You can register your business in less than three days. All the way to Philippines where it's number 124 on the uh, ease of doing business index. You look at internet penetration, it goes anywhere from 40% until 88%, but it's growing rapidly. So if you look at the uh, growth rate of the internet in Southeast Asia, Vietnam and Indonesia last year alone grew by 40%. In Asia, 210, uh, 210 million new internet users in the last one year. So it's, it's growing rapidly, and if you look at Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam, it was growing by 20% last year for the number of internet users. If you look at GDP per capita, it goes anywhere from 2,000 all the way till 65,000. And then again, total fertility index, even though we're looking at 2.3 as a region, it's really, really pulled up by Philippines, which has a total fertility rate of 2.9. So it's very diverse. But there is something similar about Southeast Asia. And the main thing is that if you focus on the top 10 cities of Southeast Asia, there are more than 110 million people who behave quite similarly from each other, to each other. So I'm just going to do a really quick quiz here. Do you know how many people live in New York City? I'm not, I'm not going to ask Peter because he knows the answer. Eight million. Woo, pretty good. Nine million. What about San Francisco? Not the Bay Area, San Francisco itself. Less than a million people. London, nine million. Hong Kong, seven million. If you look at it all together, some of the most notable cities put together is only 30 million people. Now let's go to Southeast Asia. Jakarta itself, 32 million people. Jakarta itself has more population than all these five cities put together. Metro Manila, 24 million. Bangkok, 16 million. Kuala Lumpur, Greater Kuala Lumpur, 8 million. Ho Chi Minh, 10 million. Just these top five cities in Southeast Asia put together come up to 90 million people. And you're talking about top five cities. So they're not the same as Indonesia or Philippines. They're affluent. They have money to spend. They're educated. They're well-traveled. Um, and their GDP per capita is a lot higher than the country's GDP per capita. If you look at the next five larger cities, it comes up to another 24 million people. Altogether, top 10 cities of Southeast Asia is 120, uh, more than 110 million people. So as a region, it's a very, very exciting region. And if you're trying to do business there, or you're trying to invest there, you just have to focus on these 10 cities, and you'll be able to have companies bigger than any, uh, most of the companies uh, looking at addressing a population bigger than any of these cities. So that's the first lesson that I learned, that Southeast Asia, very, very diverse, but you should really focus on the top 10 cities, and they're much more similar than, than they are different. However, even though they're similar, they all speak different languages. Not just do they speak different languages, they also practice different religions. So if you're doing business in Southeast Asia, it's important to not just understand local customs and practices and local languages, it's so vital to focus on religion as well. Because Southeast Asians, we congregate according to our religions. So if you look at Singapore, predominant religion is Buddhism, Thailand, Buddhism, Indonesia and Malaysia, Islam, Philippines, Christianity and Catholicism, and of course, Vietnam, the different types of folk religions. So this is an example of the Asian parent Malaysia. We set up, for the first three years that we set up, we had negligible traffic. We had hardly 50, 60,000 users. In 2016, we were 90,000 users. And I had no idea what I was doing differently and what was I doing wrong? Why was it not taking off? And we made one small change on September 30th, 2016. Can anyone guess what that change was? <clears throat> Anyone? <laughs> Localization, exactly. So we went into Malay language 
and we looked at the Muslim population only. We said we were not going to go after the Chinese in Malaysia. We were not going to go after the Indians in Malaysia. Even though Malaysia is made up of Malays, Chinese and Indians, very similar to Singapore, we were going to go with a completely different strategy and go slightly more Islamic and slightly more for the Malay community. We made a change into language and religion. And it, within three years, we had amassed 2.6 million Malay moms onto our platform with zero dollars in marketing. So one small change, <laughs> which always shocks me. And I did this again in the Philippines, and it was the same exact result. When we moved from English into Tagalog, when we moved from English into Cebuan, we suddenly amassed a huge following. So it's important to go into local languages in the Southeast Asian markets. The third one that I learned was that if you do not have Indonesia, you're kind of doomed in Southeast Asia. Indonesia is the crown jewel of Southeast Asia when it comes to internet companies. It's because of the sheer population size. So if you look at some of the big decacons, unicorns, and ponies, <clears throat> these are just some of the fast-growing companies in Southeast Asia. And if you look at Gojek, Grab, Ovo, and SCA, which is basically Garena and Shopee, they all have Indonesia as the forefront of what they're trying to do and build in, in our region. You look at Bukalapak, Lazada, Property Guru, Razor, and all of these other companies, they're also focused on Indonesia. So the key lesson here is if you go into Southeast Asia, Indonesia number one and Vietnam number two. If you don't have Indonesia or Vietnam, it's very, very hard to build a unicorn. My next lesson was about product. So that's your second leg of the stool. It's really important to have a good product. Um, so my key lesson when it came to product was that what works in the West does not work in Southeast Asia, unfortunately. Uh, for, does anyone know what circle there is? On the left-hand side, the three lines. Hamburger, hamburger what? Hamburger venue, exactly. We all know this, but 65% of my users in Southeast Asia had no idea what that was. That's kind of crazy. Indonesian women, Vietnamese women, Thai women, they don't know that this is a hamburger menu. To us, a menu is right on the front page. There's no menu bar. It's right there, right on the front. Super app strategy, tile menu on the front. We all navigate, go back home, and then we go to a tile menu. And it took me six years to realize this. <laughs> so, um, and, and that's because we all sit, sit down and we read things like Medium, and we read uh, you know, other types of uh, tech crunch. But that does not actually work for Southeast Asia. So if you want to build a company in Southeast Asia, learn from the Chinese. So China is a very good reference point for us. The next learning was about the different types of chatting tools and platforms that people use. Southeast Asia, again, not one, style, one size fits all strategy. So every single social sharing button is different according to which region you're in. So these are some of the tools that I use on a daily basis to talk to my users as well as talk to my team. So in terms of chatting, there's Line. Line is really big in Thailand. It's a de facto messaging app. WhatsApp for Singapore, Zalo for Vietnam, Messenger and Viber for the Philippines. Uh, if you want to read news, you go to Facebook, you go to Twitter. Twitter's really big in Indonesia. If you're doing pictures, it's Instagram, except Pinterest. Pinterest in Indonesia, Pinterest in Singapore. And then the same way for videos, YouTube, and of course, most recently, TikTok. Very, very popular in Indonesia as well as uh, Vietnam. Southeast Asia is all about FaceTime and relationship. Yesterday, I was talking to someone who was telling me that the one key difference that she learned about working in uh, Singapore versus working in Germany was that she had to meet her clients all the time. And she says that when I did business in Germany, I didn't have to meet anyone. I just pick up the phone and I call them or I FaceTime them or I do a Zoom call with them. But I didn't have to go down and meet them. Whereas in Southeast Asia, it's impossible to close a business deal unless you do a glass of wine, a coffee, a sake shot, or you go to a karaoke lounge and sing your hearts out at night. So it's all about offline and online with your users, with your business partners. And in Chinese, we have a term called guanxi, which is basically relationship. And that is the heart of doing business in Southeast Asia. So even if you look at China, again, very similar to Southeast Asia. So a lot of companies are going offline, and it's not just online anymore. 
The seventh lesson that I learned in Southeast Asia, it's all about people. And that's your third leg of the stool, which makes it very, very sturdy. So talent, that's a big issue that we experience here in Asia. And talent, it can't be taught, but it can be awakened. So what do we do with regards to talent? So the first thing we do is super focused specializations. It's very hard to build one country and say it's going to serve all of Southeast Asia. So we look at India for technology. We look at Philippines for content, for customer service. We look at Singapore for finance, for legal, and also for UI, UX, and product. So you don't do product in India because the design sensibilities of the Indians and the design sensibilities of the Southeast Asians are very different from each other. And then you do Indonesia for design, uh, with, when it, with regards to graphic design, for example. So it's about building up small little hubs and using talent across the board. Now, the good thing about Southeast Asia is it takes you an hour and a half to fly from Singapore to Indonesia. It takes you two hours to fly to Thailand. It takes you another uh, hardly five hours to reach India. So it's quite connected to each other in that sense. The eighth point, and this is really, really quite critical, is about the founder's mindset. So this is how long it takes to IPO, exit a company around the world. If you look at China, it takes about three to five years. So that's why the Chinese believe in 996. You work six days a week, nine to nine, 12 hour days, and you just chong for the next five years, and you're gonna have a great exit. And everyone's gonna be working nine, uh, 12 hour days, six days a week, and not have a life. And you can do that if it's just for five years. In the US, it takes somewhere between four to seven years, if you look at Facebook and all the other big internet companies, for them to have an IPO. Whereas in Southeast Asia, it takes between 10 to 17 years for a company to have an exit or an IPO. And this affects a lot of things. This affects fund structures. For example, a lot of VC funds are set up for eight years or eight plus two plus two. That does not make sense for Southeast Asia because you're going to be pressurizing the founder to exit before the market is ready for them to see an exit. This also affects, of course, founders themselves and the kind of um, employees that you attract because employees cannot exit in two years or three years and make a ton of money. You need to commit somewhere between 10 to 20 years of your life working on one business idea. And that means that you're going to fall sick you're probably going to get married, you might get a divorce, you might get pregnant, you might have a miscarriage, you might have ailing parents. All of that, that's gonna happen in that 15 years that you're building a business. So it's really important to invest in resilient founders with grit who do not burn out. So it takes three times more uh, time to create a successful business in Southeast Asia versus China, for example. And the last one, the most important one, is about rallying the troops with a common cause. You know, at the end of the day, we sit in for board meetings and we say, hey, we want to create an EBITDA positive company. We want to focus on, you know, LTV and CAC and um, all the other types of metrics on what success is or, you know, how much fundraising that we get and what kind of, um, you know, IRR are we offering our investors. But at the end of the day, do all of these things really matter? We've realized that if you focus on cause and purpose, which is what's so beautiful about DLD, because it's all about what things that matter, it actually allows you to create a much better business. So EY did a study, and they looked at the companies that prioritize purpose. They achieved 10% or more revenue growth over three years. So that's 58% of companies that did that. So purpose matters. Purpose and matters to your customers, your employees, your top line, your bottom line, as well as to your team and your leaders. So at our company, we take purpose as the main thing that drives us forward. Purpose is what makes us wake up in the morning and do the 996 Chinese hours for the last eight years. So what's our cause? Our cause is to reduce the number of stillborn babies born in Southeast Asia by 10% in the next three years. So we take making sure that we're saving babies' lives. 7,000 babies every single year in Southeast Asia die because, and it was not meant to be, because 40% of stillbirths can be prevented. So as a company, we've publicly taken this on as our cause. And when we go for board meetings, and when Deloitte does our audits for us, we look at how many babies and stillbirths did we manage to prevent so that's our purpose, and that's what drives me 
my shareholders, my team. That's our cause. My question to you is, what's your purpose? That's it. Thank you.